<laughs> fervently for the uh, for the European Union and for our our eurozone. I, I'm going to be very informal, and um, unfortunately, because we've had difficulties booking or getting my flight booked online, I have to head out fairly fast. But I just want to make a point that the last three years have been an absolute disaster uh, for Europe. Uh, at a very time when we needed leadership, we've got panic. Uh, at the very time when we needed to be cohesive and to have the community method operating, everything that we've put in place uh, seems to have collapsed. I think the most important thing for the last three years has been it's, a, it's been disturbingly inept. There seems to have been a lack of capacity uh, to grasp uh, the issue. Uh, the, the roots of the Eurozone go back, in my view, way before 2007 and the credit collapse and way before Lehman Brothers. Uh, that the, my view is that the problems lie in the very foundation of the, of the Eurozone and in the way it's been structured. Uh, I, I think from time to time it's, it's a good idea for us to sit, sit back and ask ourselves, how did we get to where we are? Because if you think of the period when the, Europe, when the European Central Bank was created, uh, and you think of, of when the Eurozone was, was when the Euro, Euro notes were circulated only 10 years ago, it was a period of extraordinary optimism. In fact, not only was it a period of optimism, there's an American song that talks about people being cockeyed optimists. <coughs> and it was a period of cockeyed optimism because basically there were assumptions made yeah, at that time that frankly were never ever going to endure. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's easy to forget that the Eurozone is still in relative times as a very, very short period. Now, I have specific criticisms I'm going to make about the European Central Bank, but I think for balance, it's very important to make the point that the European Central Bank has actually been phenomenally successful. I mean, it, it, only very shortly after the ECB was established, it had the biggest launch of a currency in human history, and did it very successfully. Uh, a, a very short time later, only 12 months later, and people forget this, in 2003, there was a crisis. The crisis was that Germany and France had breached the mastery criteria, and because they had breached the mastery criteria, we came up with a solution, which is not the solution, to ignore the criteria. Now, you have to ask ourselves, what would have happened if the mastery criteria had been doggedly adhered to? And of course, the European Central Bank has had to deal with some really tough challenges in the meantime. Uh, the crisis in 2007, the, the, the credit con, uh, the crisis with the collapse of, of, of uh, Lehman Brothers. Uh, and I think to be fair to the European Central Bank, it did very, very well. It propped up the banking system, which could well have collapsed in 2008, 2009, uh, when the new government in Greece discovered that the previous government had been created, to put it mild, uh, mildly with the accounts. But again, the European Central Bank, I think, it proved itself well. It stepped in, it became involved in the, in the bailout. When the collapse of the Irish banking system became a virtual reality, again, it was a calm and reflective response from the ECB. So I think the point should be made that the ECB uh, has been, it has within its limited structure, and it is a very limited structure, it has, I think, been quite creative in dealing with the crucial, with the crisis. But the intervention of the ECB um, at the time of the banking crisis and at the time of the Greek crisis, the first Greek crisis, was in interesting because, of course, they had a, a debate with themselves in the ECB. Uh, and, and what they did was uh, they became involved in buying bonds on the secondary markets because, of course, it's anathema to buy bonds directly from the, from the member states. Uh, but there is one thing about the approach. I think that the more the ECB intervened in this creative way in the markets, uh, buying distressed Eurozone member state bonds, I think the more it actually sent out a notice of panic itself. And I think that the markets responded in a way which was extraordinarily negative to what was a positive intervention. And indeed, into the, the, if you go back and you have to look at the debate, particularly the debate involving um, Axel Weber, uh, he was very irritated by the decision that had been taken by the board of the ECB. Uh, he had a purist view that, the, that, it was a, that this was a, an excessively creative use of the interpretation of the statute. He may have been right. 
So the point was that the well-intentioned, and, and in my view, quite successful intervention by the ECB, uh, that had fueled the very concerns that existed in the market, and in a sense it produced something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. My strong view is that the biggest single problem insofar as the ECB is concerned, and insofar as the Eurozone is concerned, uh, that the construct was in fact a very flimsy construct. First and foremost, uh, the Eurozone, the, 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 um, the architects of the Eurozone were astonishingly optimistic. They were excessively optimistic. They didn't forecast what would happen if the unseeable would happen. What would happen if something like Lehman's came about? When you're designing a, 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 a union, a monetary union, to, to deal with the lives and the well-being of 27 member states, well, the best part of 27 member states, I think you have a responsibility to be, to be very creative in examining what could go wrong. And if you look at the, the ECB, its only focus, and, and Dragi made this point yesterday, its only real focus is on preventing inflation. But central banks do more than just prevent inflation. Uh, so the first point is that uh, the European Central Bank itself had a very narrow remit. It didn't have the traditional powers of central banks. And more to the point, it was missing a very important partner. If you look at the Eurozone and you make a comparison with any nation, there's a partnership between a fiscal authority that is centrally in control of fiscal policies and the monetary authority of the central bank. And you can't cut paper with the scissors that has only got one side. You need the two sides. So if you're going to deal with uh, the type of tra challenges we have, you can't deal with it with the scissors, the shears, with only one side on it. There's, uh, there's also, it has to be said, the regulatory capacity of the European Central Bank was not well, uh, was not well applied. And, and, and if you want to prove of that, all you have to do is look at the Irish case. Between 1996 and 2005-2006, there was a phenomenal flood of, 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 of uh, credit, of, of money, uh, of capital, into the Irish economy. It was absolutely extraordinary. When I was Minister for the Environment in 2006, I called on the building and construction industry representatives into my office and said, listen, last year you built 86,000 houses in a population of only 4.2 million. What's your point? Every child at the moment they're born is going to get the key of a house. Because this was, it was crazy. Uh, it was obvious we were entering into a classical property bubble, but there was no way you could stop it. As minister, if you decided, well, we're not going to build 86,000 houses, supply would, would be dropping, but demand would be escalating, and prices would have simply gone even crazier. The flow of cheap capital fueled a classic property bubble in Ireland. It was involved in a similar similarly in Spain and to a degree in Portugal. And the European Central Bank was the only authority centrally seated that could have prevented this or could have seen what was happening and didn't. And so that was a fault, a flaw. And I also think that the critics of uh, the the uh, of the bank have tended to overlook the fact that the other players in the field uh, also had a very flawed response. Uh, all too often, the response to the crisis has been fragmented. It has been reactive rather than creative. I think, for example, if you look at the European Commission, in my view, with the exception of Ali Wren, who I think has done a good job, I think the Commission has largely been asleep. Uh, I, I really see that there has been no leadership there. It may be that Barossa is now in the second term and he's, he's like a lame duck American president. He's not particularly created. But certainly the Commission's role has been decidedly second rate. The other big institutional players, um, I, I think, uh, have the, the Council, of the, uh, the, council of the, 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 the President of the European Council. I mean, Van Rompuy has actually, he's a very intelligent man, a shrewd man, he's a very pleasant man. But it has to be said, for the last year and a half, uh, he seems to have been, a, 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 at best, a photographic prop uh, at, at press conferences. The ECOFIN itself has been involved, the Council has been involved, the European Council has been largely involved, and none of it instills confidence. And of course, there have been individual national failures, catastrophic individual national failures. In the Irish case, the, regulatory, the banking regulatory system just didn't work. 
one bank, one bank, Anglo Bank, with uh, only two branch offices in the world, threatened to bring down, or could have brought down, not just the entire Irish banking sector, but in 2008, when we discovered what was going on, the ramifications were that the entire European banking sector would have fallen like some set of dominoes. Uh, and, and, and that really points to uh, something fundamentally wrong. And it wasn't just in the Irish banks. If you look at RBS uh, and the manner in which that particular bank behaved, to give you an example, um, the electricity company in Ireland used to have a shop to sell white goods. They had lots of shops around the country. They were sold up in, in 2001, 2002. And all of the properties were actually bought up by RBS. And they moved in to the, what used to be where you would buy your electrical kettle or your mixer or your washing machine or whatever. And they took on a lot of the staff and they trained them up. And all of a sudden, the old traditional way of dealing with people who wanted to buy property changed dramatically. You could walk in off the street and you could get a 100% mortgage to buy property. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. I had the experience of, of, of people within my own family, young, young, young people, who were maybe two or three years out of college, getting loans in excess of 400,000 euros to buy, to buy apartments. It was mad, mad stuff. The previous arrangement was, if you were buying a property, you had to have 20% saved. You couldn't get a mortgage that was any greater than 2.2 or quarter percent of your salary. And those old traditions had meant that you didn't have runaway inflation in house prices. But that changed, and everybody knew that it was changing, and everybody in the regulatory system closed their eyes, and, and so that, and that was also, that, 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 was a, that was a feature elsewhere. And if you look at, of course, other countries, well, as I've spoken about Greece, uh, Portugal, Italy, the situation in Italy was made bad, bad by political tithering, and tithering was also a feature in, in Spain. There's an expression in Ireland that the good Lord should save us and protect us from those who want to do the best thing for us. And the best example of how that applies in the context of the crisis in the Eurozone was in the lead up to the October 2010 Bill meeting between Sarkozy and, and Chancellor Merkel. When Chancellor Merkel introduced, in my view, if you read what she said, there's nothing wrong. She spoke about moral hazard. She spoke about the necessity for moral hazard to enter into it so that countries that behaved impro improperly had to pay the consequence of their actions. But there was one thing that was missing, and that was that banks and the financiers behind the banks and the people behind the speculation, it seems to me that they have always been excluded from the moral, moral hazard. The, it was always a good, there was, there was never a good time in the middle of the crisis to start talking about moral hazard. Because by introducing the topic, it was the equivalent of putting a rag that was dosed with petrol onto an already dangerous fire. Because what that did, and if you actually look at it, there's a wonderful sequence of events. If you look at that period, October to November 2010, that's when the time changed. We have a situation where in, in October and November, the European Commission and people in the ECB became very worried about our position in Ireland. But we were still fully funded, I said this to you today, we were fully funded to July 2011. So we didn't need to go back into the market. And in fact, in October, this is often for back in October 2010, we had quite a good energy sale on the bond market. But everything changed after Dovea. Everything changed dramatically. There's an, an old poem in Ireland that all change changed utterly and a terrible beauty was born. On the night of the European Finance Minister's meeting in Korea, in advance of the Seoul meeting, Oli Wren called my friend, who is now passed on, the Minister for Finance, to say everything has changed. The atmosphere has changed. We are now going to Ireland. We'll have to go to the IMF and the ECB for bailout. And the argument was that, uh, that if we went, it would protect or prevent the contagion from spreading to the other European countries. I argued very strongly that that wasn't necessary at the time. I argued that we should not uh, have done that because my argument and my belief was at the time that far from, from preventing contagion, that that would be a sign that Europe had lost its way and the very thing that we didn't want to happen would happen. And the, 
The other thing that happened, uh, and I think it was unfair to blame um, Chancellor Merkel for it, of course, certainly in, in the Irish political atmosphere, but not just in Ireland, but in other places, when the discussion of burning the bondholders came up, when, when the idea that moral hazard would apply to the private sector and the private sector would carry some of the load, when that, when that became part of the political currency, uh, people began to look around, oh, there might be a simple and an easy way out. Somebody else will pay for the prices. And that, of course, I think further informed. I mean, for example, in, in Ireland, if you go and look at the papers for October, September, September, October, November of 2010, I mean, it was just extraordinary. There were serious political commentators, serious economists, and in fact, the leading opposition party talking about, oh, we'll burn the bondholders and they will bear the, the brunt. I and mean, if you did that in a country that's an open economy like Ireland, it would be destructive. Nobody's going to give you credit again in the future, so you just can't behave like that. But nonetheless, the, the illusion was there. Most importantly, at this time, at that particular time, of August, September, October, November 2010, I believe the community met the tide. Duvel was basically a private meeting between the leaders of two nations two of the biggest nations in the, in the European Union, two very important nations, but it was a private meeting. It was not a community meeting. And again, the message that went out was wrong. Of course, in addition to all of that, we have the other problem uh, that we have to deal with, and we have to deal with still. It's the what I call the cuckoo in the nest. It's the continuous and the frustrating position of the United Kingdom. Is it in? Is it out? It's halfway there, sometimes it's halfway in, sometimes it's halfway out. Like the UK ambiguous position, I think, has always, always been very difficult to handle. So that leads me to this year. And the year 2011, I think, when, it's that, when we sit down and we do the history, we realize it has been a disastrous year for Europe. I mean, basically, if we looked like a crowd of lost souls in the desert, we looked like we didn't have any compass, any point of reference. Uh, and I, I, I was saying to, to a colleague yesterday, I was looking back over some of my papers from when I was lecturing in UCD and I lectured in public finance. And I, I thought that the best description of our current position in Europe was to be found in an essay written back in 1959 by Charles Lindblom of Yale University. He wrote about, the, 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 about in, in a panic, the best way to get there is to muddle through. And he wrote this the essay called The Art of Muddling Truth. In fact, in 1979, he wrote another essay called Still Muddling Truth. And in between the two, he wrote what he called, uh, his, he developed what he called his Echternet Theory. And as you know, the, in that little village in, 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 in Luxembourg, the, the, uh, the pilgrims are going to St. Willowbrook's tomb. They take two steps forward and one step back. And he, I, I felt that his description applied. I mean, basically, we, were, we muddled through the year 2011. There was no leadership, there was no coherence. In fact, worse, if you actually look at it and you analyze that whole series of meetings that took place between the, Char the Chancellor and the President uh, of France, the Chancellor of Germany and the President of France, they weren't even coherent within themselves from meeting to meeting. They were changing. To be fair to them, they were speaking as they saw fit in their own country case. You have to ask, where in the name of goodness were the other 25? Uh, EU member state leaders, and in particular, where were the 15 uh, other member states governments from, from, from the Eurozone? Why this extraordinary silence? And, and there's something seriously wrong there. The meeting, my view is that the council meeting last week was it is just another disaster on top of a whole series of disasters. For nine years, I was Minister for European Affairs. Uh, I was there for the Irish presidency, but oddly enough, for the very first Irish presidency, I was a civil servant servicing the presidency. So I've seen a lot of work in Europe. Since 1973, when I first entered the Department of Finance, I was involved in European affairs. So for, for all the years I had on life, I've been backwards and forwards. I have never, ever, ever experienced a meeting that was so ill-prepared as the European Council of the 8th and 9th of December. If you were running a very substantial, even a medium-sized business, you would not have a board meeting during the course of a crisis where you didn't have a clear view as to what was going to come out of it. We are now in the, t in the tenth day after the meeting, and we still don't know clearly 
uh, what came out. And I just saying there's some uh, something on the on the uh, an email going around today saying that even the 200 million additional um, um, money that was supposed to be put in for the for the IMF that there's some doubts about that. I, I think that the, the council meeting demonstrated in real detail the difficulties that Europe is in. It, it illustrated in more in even more grim detail the very peculiar position and precarious position of the United Kingdom. It did reach one decision which I think is a good decision, the decision on a fiscal authority. It reached it in a bad way, however, the idea that the fiscal authority is to be put in place by some sort of informal compact. I don't know how that's going to happen. I have no doubt that the ingenuity of the, of the, of the legal services of the union would be sufficient to produce some ingenious device. But we don't need an ingenious device. What we need is, in fact, this to be done within the treaties. Because if this is not done within the treaties, if this is done intergovernmentally, it will certainly seriously undermine the capacity for whatever is done to be ratified. Because if you actually look at the arrangements last week, the, we were told that the detail would be available in March. But the devil is always in the detail. And between now and March, there's plenty of time to speculate about what is going to be in the detail. But one thing is certain is that the, um, the electorates, the people, the public out there are alarmed because they can see the lack of leadership. They can see, and it's palpable, the degree of confusion. It's all too easy in, in turbulent times for ministers and governments to stray from the paths of fiscal rectitude. So they see that there are all sorts of, of issues that have, we have to deal with. Um, the idea of a, of a mechanism enshrined in, in constitutional law in the individual member states, I think is actually not a bad idea at all. Although I do have a bit of a problem with it. It's inflexible. If you think about it, uh, when you have a crisis, you don't need <coughs> inflexible solutions. You need flexible solutions. Um, I think the, there is no doubt that the services, that the compact, or whatever we call it, will be produced. But I think it will be dominated, or seen to be dominated, by two member states. Uh, it is very clear uh, that the protections which are woven into the fabric of the European treaties, and which apply to the smaller states, some of whom may well have referenda, but those protections will not be there. And it would be very easy, in fact it would be very, very simple, for your scepticism uh, to play on this. I mean, I've handled three referenda, and a referendum is a very strange animal. No matter what question you ask, or how carefully you craft the question, one thing is absolutely certain. You get an answer to all sorts of other questions. Um, I think the, the, um, the outcome of the December 8 and 9 council meeting is it's over-focused on, on the idea that there is a silver bullet and that fiscal control is the silver bullet. Fiscal control in itself is not sufficient to deal with this. First and foremost, if you think about it, fiscal controls will, by definition, because we're talking about cutting, they'll be pro-cyclical. So what you'll be doing is in the case of economies that are in a difficult position, where there is a deficiency in domestic consumption, you're going to cut money out of it. And that's not just bad politics, that's bad economics. Because at the very time when economies need to be supported, when job creation needs to be supported, when it, it, consumption needs to be encouraged, you are doing precisely the opposite. Uh, so there is, a, there is an issue there. Um, the, and, and again, if you actually look at, at it, it's very, very interesting, uh, just by way of demonstration again to the Irish case, we have, to the letter, applied the rules. And for the first two quarters of 2011, there was signs that things were going well. The, um, Competitiveness that is strongly uh, returned to the economy. Uh, the export markets were therefore very, very buoyant. But in the third quarter, there's been a total collapse of domestic demand. 
And I suggest to you it's not just in Ireland. If you actually look at the United Kingdom, where the government is going through an austerity program at the moment, there is panic in the streets where the wholesalers and the retailers are trying to move, prop, move product before the Christmas period. Because they know full well uh, that there's a deficiency of demand there. Uh, it's interesting that one of the commission members, during the course of the council meeting, he tweeted his concerns that the solution would dismantle Europe's social model. Now, I think he might have been overstating it, but he had a point. He also flagged that the sanctions that which automatically uh, reign in public expenditure would not be the best approach uh, for a fiscal union that needs collective democratic decision making. And I don't know about the rest of you in this audience here. The idea that the Irish Central Bank of the German, sorry, the Irish uh, Constitutional Court and the German Constitutional Court, in addition to making decisions about law, are now going to start making decisions about economics. It's not something that fills me with joy. He, he, he also touched on, on the point of the lack of, of attention, and this is the final point I made. What he saw was the major flaw in the, um, in the December Council. And this was the lack of attention to the role of the ECB. I've already praised the ECB for its work. But I think if you think about it, it's very important every now and again to stand back and ask, how did we get where we are? It, it, there is, the system has worked and survived, but just about currently the system is hanging on by its fingertips. I believe that the ECB needs to be very significantly, and I don't agree with the uh, Draghi who spoke in the Parliament yesterday. Draghi said in the Parliament yesterday something I like thought utterly amazing. And he was quite lucky I wasn't there because if he did, I'd have been hectoring. He made the point, first of all, that he ruled out any change in the ECB agreement during his watch. Well, tell. It's not up to Draghi to decide what the role of the ECB will be. The ECB is a creature of the statute. And the statute is created by, by 17 sovereign nations coming together. It's not up to an Italian banker to make the decision. Important though he is, uh, and good and that the ECB is a creature of statute, and the member states determine what is in that statute, and it's up to the member states to take leadership in it. In, in, he also said yesterday, he was asked, why um, the ECB hadn't become involved in uh, quantitative easing, which is printing money, the same in the United States. First of all, he, if I were in his position, I'd have made the answer that the American Central Bank, the Fed, hadn't been so conspicuously successful. Think about it, because the American economy isn't exactly robust at the moment. But what he said was astonishing. He said, and, I, and I'm quoting, he said, the Fed's mandate is different, from the, is different uh, to the ECB's. It's geared to growth and jobs. We are much more restricted to monetary stability. But tell that to the millions of Europeans who currently face unemployment. Tell it to the hundreds of thousands of small businesses who are going to be driven out of business. Surely to goodness, in political and public life, the whole purpose of public policy is to serve the needs of the people, not to serve the needs of the financial industry. And I think that the millions of people who face the hardship of contraction and the loss of livelihoods would ask Mr. Draghi to have the opportunity, well, why in the name of goodness aren't you focused on growth and jobs and creating prosperity? Surely it's not just about applying rules to deal with the financial markets. My belief is that the statute and the, and, and the bank are an end to a means, not a means in themselves. Not an end, they're a means to an end, not, a, not an end in themselves. The two further aspects of the drama of the last few months would bother me personally. I believe for all its warts, democracy happens to be a damp side better than all of the alternatives. And the fact that we have seen governments that have made mistakes, but democratically elected governments being replaced with technocrats. It doesn't fill me as a Democrat with joy. I think that it's a little odd that Europe is pointing the finger at people in the Near East and Middle East talking about uh, democracy. Uh, our claims about the European project being ultimately a democratic project are undermined every time 
Democrat, democratically elected politicians with freedom of play and all of the things that they have are replaced. The second thing that disturbed me greatly is the fact that technocrats, particularly in the ECB, seem to take it upon themselves to organize the course of history. Now, we saw that last year, uh, again during the Irish crisis, but not immediately during the Irish crisis, when a group of people took it upon themselves to control events uh, rather than it happening. I've argued for a long time that we've had a convention on the future of Europe, and what we desperately need now is a convention for the future of the Euro. I do not believe that it should be left to the determination of one or two people. The Convention on the Future of Europe was a very interesting project because it was quintessentially democratic. All of the member state parliaments were involved, all of the member state governments were involved, the Council was involved, the Commission was involved, the European Parliament was involved, peripherally in observer status, the social partners were involved. Now people say, oh, a convention has time written all over it. I put it to the horn, I leave you with this thought. It took 100 days to construct the Marshall Plan. If the will was there in the next 100 days between now and the end of March, when we have the next constitution, we could construct a plan that would have democratic support to save the world. Thank you for your time.